Presbyopia is the most prevalent refractive error of all in the patient population with the most disposable income. Why is it the most prevalent procedure? This makes no sense. My financial disclosures are that, that I do have a financial interest in presbyopic correction. I believe that we can summarize the problem by thinking about three elements. The first one is we've had globally an ineffective marketing strategy. We have probably a hundred to one lens surgeons to laser surgeons. And we have a system where informed consent is not being done according to the rules. I'm going to go through these points. Let's talk about ineffective marketing. And I love to use this example because the airlines do not say our A320-200 is more safe and more effective than their A320-200. What they say is, we go to this destination, or we're cheaper, or we give you a better experience on board, or, it's a, or the, we have more benefits. They're marketing not the procedure. They're marketing presbyopic correction. This industry has been very successful in making safety phenomenally high, despite an increase in volume of procedures. And this is driving their industry. So we need to think about a shift in the way that we market, because from a patient's perspective, he has to say, he, she has to say, well, I can have glasses or contact lenses. I can have femtosecond smile monovision. I can have a multifocal IOL. I can have an EDOF or a monovision IOL. I can have eczema laser monovision LASIK. I can have presbyont. I can have a multifocal cornea. I can have LTK, CK, intracore, Caraflex. Or I can have a corneal inlay. Or I can have a lenticle implantation. Now, this is a hard nut for a lay person to crack. Now this room, like I said earlier, 50% of the people in this room are PhD scientists who probably, I suspect, could look at all of the published evidence and decide for a particular patient's eye which is the best procedure. The other 50% of the room are ophthalmologists. Ophthalmologists, I'm going to say, are broadly divided into two categories. We have refractive surgeons, and we have diffractive surgeons. And I'm, and, I'm going to, and I'm going to sort of talk a little bit about diffractive surgeons. So before I do that, I want to talk about something that I've learned in my 30 years as a refractive surgeon. I've seen a product development cycle which has been absolutely consistent throughout all of the failed products and successful products. First, there's a great idea. There's a small sample size study. It's presented at a meeting with excellent and promising results. And then the marketing effort goes, that, that's where this is the fork in the road. The marketing effort is either cautious and accurate, or it's false promises and exaggerated claims. And that's the fork, because what happens then is, Further clinical trials are done with larger numbers, and we start to learn about the complications and the technique issues and the long-term results. And this, of course, leads to further R&D to improve the product or improve the surgical technique. And all of this, of course, interacts constantly with the marketing effort on the uh, circuit of, 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 of eye surgeons' meetings. And then either the product is abandoned or it becomes established. That's the cycle. So let's look at an example here. The array lens. The marketing effort at the launch of this was Sweden, ESCRS 2007, and the, the, the claim was that it was going to replace refractive surgery. And that was obviously you know, a, a false promise and an exaggerated claim. And the low patient tolerance and the quality of vision issues and the low contrast sensitivity meant that this lens was removed from the market. No one used it. But then we were given the restore, and exactly the same thing happened. 
Then we were given the resume, and exactly the same thing happened. Then people were mixing the two lenses, mix and match, and the same thing happened. And then we look at the uh, competitor, and they had a plus four lens, which they realized had to be made a plus 325, and they realized they had to make it plus 275 to make it effective and make the patient tolerance sufficient for you know, reasonable happiness. But yet these lenses were ab 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 abandoned by, this, by that company. And they then presented to us in London at this meeting the, 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 the symphony as if it's, as if it's an Edolf lens, which Damien Gatinel showed us that it's not. It's a bifocal diffractive lens. So this was actually abandoned because two years later they said, oh yeah, well, actually we said it was an Edolf lens, but even the presenter at this meeting on this podium said, well, it's a so-called uh, extended depth of field lens. Now we have an extended depth of field lens, but actually it's a diffractive IOL. And the competition, of course, is saying, oh, those diffractive optics are bad. We have segmental refractive optics and we have much better EDOF. And they make up terms like non-diffractive X-wave. It's like, what? That's not even science, that's marketing. And it confuses everyone as to sort of like, it's a pseudo-scientific name, it doesn't exist. We know that this lens is not successful in all the patients. We have patients who are exceedingly unhappy. They give it a satisfaction score of zero. And this is a guy who's an American who lives in London, went to the States to have it put in, and is, had a YAG, and now he has to have an exchange. He said, I can't live like this. And he has smallish pupils. It's not an issue. It's to do with the fact that the pupil is not concentric with his bag. And so he, has, he doesn't have good centration of these segmental refractive optics. And he has problems with aberrations. Let's look at the, the champions of trifocality. Well, the AT Lisa, in, in the formal studies that are done arm's length, found that 64% had moderately disturbing or worse glare. And another study that showed in Spain, and in Spain people have very small pupils, so the, you would expect the problem to be less, but they still had a great deal of problems driving at night in 6% with moderate in a quarter of them. So it brings us to this thing where it's like, it's always like, is it cornea or lens? And I already presented this concept at, a meeting, at this meeting before. There, it's not cornea or lens, because you can do either cornea or lens with multifocality, spherical aberration with a an, 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 an microanosmetropia, or monovision. You can do that on the lens or the cornea. Now, personally, you all know that I developed this concept and presented it at a user meeting for Zeiss in 2007. In 2008, I presented it at this meeting first. 2009, I published our first paper in hyperopes up to plus six, then myopes up to minus eight, then emetropes. Then I was invited like a little goldfish into a shark tank at ACOS to debate you know, with John Marshall, who at the end agreed that this modality was actually a good idea. Then I was invited here to say, to give my opinion, which was that multifocal surgery is going to come to an end. That was my prediction in 2015. And then I started teaching a course with my team. And during this course, some interesting things happened. We found that surgeons who came to us, who were very busy presbyopic surgeons, intraocularly with diffractive optics, were switching to this procedure because multifocality has less safety, less accuracy, and monovision has less efficacy. Spherical aberration and microanosmetropia, as a static solution for the loss of the dynamic process of accommodation, doesn't have these advantages, disadvantages. And what we've seen in the industry overall is a convergence of practically everyone now talking about EDOF. It, it's, the, the language has changed. And even if they're not EDOF lenses, they still call them EDOF lenses because that's the buzz now. Everyone says now EDOF is better. No, it's, it's not multifocal. It's like that's a dirty word now. And so my prediction in 2015 at this meeting was correct. Now, it's time to stop confusing doctors and the public. False promises and exaggerated claims have to stop. Here's an example. Permanent lens replacement. That's 
brilliant marketing because it implies to the patient that if you have a lens surgery, your vision is permanently corrected. But the fact is, we know that corneal astigmatism changes in a third of patients by a diopter of cylinder within five years after the age of 40. And therefore, that multifocal will not work as well five years from now, and it will require a laser procedure to bring it back to the original perfect result. We need to stop false claims, and we need to start thinking about the principles of informed consent. Professor Graham Barrett, surgical interventions need to be in the patient's best interest before any commercial considerations are raised. And George Baiko, RLE is not as safe or effective as we believe, and we need to collectively sit back and look at the data. My experience has been that in most patients, when presented with the data, they decide against an RLE procedure, and that's wise. Now, let's go back to Graham. An overly commercial approach risks diminishing the professional status of ophthalmologists as physicians and surgeons. The Royal College of Ophthalmologists, where I work in the UK, says in their guidance to refractive surgeons, paragraph 21, you must tell prospective patients if alternative interventions are available that could meet their needs with less risk, including from other practitioners. Now, let's look at what's going on around the world. What is the most common, we know what the most common presbyopic procedure that's offered to patients is. We know what it is. It's lens surgery, clear lens exchange. Even though surgeons can do monovision LASIK, they offer lens surgery. There are lots of reasons for this, but there's commercial pressure on this. Now, what is the most common presbyopic procedure chosen by surgeons for their own eyes? Now, to answer this, we can look at some, some data. Here's a, here's a survey that was done of AUPO approved, ACGME approved residency program attendings. And these people were aggressive presbyopic surgeons. They had a 60% conversion rate to presbyopic eye wells. That's a very good conversion rate. But interestingly, when asked, they said what is the most, that 93% that of them said that quality of vision is the most important factor when choosing an eye well. And when then asked what would they choose for their own eyes if they had spherical corneas or if they had toric corneas, it turns out that even though more than 60% of these surgeons implant these presbyopic correction eye wells, over 60% of them would choose a monofocal for their own eyes. And we learned this the other way around. So we started teaching our course in 2016 and a good friend came to take the course, and he said, wow, can you do it on my eyes? I'm a plano presbyo. And we said, yes. And then another surgeon came, uh, the, the next course, six months later, and he was medical director of a company that had multiple clinics around the country, and their push was multifocal IOLs. And he said, I'm 62, can you do my procedure? And what we found was that there was like a domino effect of people coming to the course and then saying, can I do it? And then I said, well, yes, but why don't you do it at the next course, three days before, and then you can present your own experience at the course. So what we also found was that these surgeons who had had the procedure on their own eyes, they took their own medicine, they were changing their practices, and they were doing less RLE and more LBV, more presbyond. And they, what was happening was that they were noticing that not only it was easier to convert a patient, a presbyopic patient, to surgery offering LASIK than it was offering a refractive lens exchange. Therefore, they were doing way higher volumes off the bat on presbyopic patients because they were offering LASIK, not intraocular surgery. And surgeons were switching their practices from RLE to presbyond and having commercial success. Barbara Czarnota in Poland, she's medical director of 13 clinics at Optegra there. They've had a huge success in volume increase of surgery, paying patients, and a decrease, obviously, in the RLE. This is an example in one of the top clinics in Romania, same story. And, interestingly, 
they're charging more for presbyond than they are for RLE with the trifocal. Because the patients say, well, why is it more? It's because, because it's better, because the visual quality is better. That's why it costs more. Why do women pay 500 euros for a plastic bag? Because it says LV on it. It's a, it, it's a perceived value. One of the top clinics in Spain, same story. So when we get back to this question, what is the most common presbyopic procedure chosen by surgeons for their own eyes? It's very clear. It's corneal procedures. It's LASIK monovision or presbyopic. So why is confidence in presbyopia surgery so low? I'm coming to my conclusions here. Well, clearly, the salesman doesn't believe in his own product. He's selling Sony televisions, but he has a Samsung at home. Are refractive, are dif are diffractive surgeons really giving full informed consent? That's a question. I mean, we know that there's a hundred eye surgeons who don't do laser to one surgeon who does do laser and lens. And we also know that the diffractive surgeons who come to a presbyopic course and then either have the procedure or implement the procedure, we know that they shift their practice from an intraocular bilateral intraocular procedure to a bilateral extraocular procedure. And they have huge financial success. This debate that we can have to, in, in this room, that's fine. We can argue with a veins coming out of our neck, no problem. But this is debate with data, as I said this morning. If you're all going to present data that cannot be compared to other data, then your, 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 public, your presentation is not really useful to the scientific community. We need to have this debate in-house, not out in the public domain. The, the patients, as soon as you confuse patients, they pull back and say, I'm going to wait. We've had this marketing externally, which is totally chaotic, and therefore has compressed and suppressed the market, suppressed confidence. Obviously, we have commercial influences because very few surgeons do both procedures. And so if you're a, only a lens surgeon, then, well, you're going to offer lens surgery. And so that gets into encroaching the question of informed consent. And let's face it, we already see that patients are more likely to be converted to a LASIK procedure than they are to a bilateral clear lens exchange. We, we, that's a fact. So obviously, they're not being given all the information if they opt for a lens procedure. The, the, there is a, the, uh, this is a, a, a kind of like a harsh reality that you have to sort of infer from the way the market has developed. So my recommendations are, we must market externally as surgeons who correct presbyopia, not as surgeons who do this procedure and it's better than their procedure. We gotta keep the debate out of the public domain. We keep it in the science room. We have to, in the science room, do evidence-based arm's length evaluation of how things work, which means, at the ISOP next year, I don't want to see any presentations that, have, that are not presenting the standard graphs for refractive surgery with lens or with a corneal procedure or any other procedure. We have standards that are published for lens or cornea, and you must adhere to those. Otherwise, we cannot really assess the value of what you're talking about. And we also have to, because the, the problem with, with, with doing what we, what we see on the podium is that it, it, it influences doctors with marketing hype and sweeping things under the carpet and hiding the dirty laundry. Which means that we have to also put some peer pressure on our colleagues to be less prone to financial bias and their financial interests when presenting material with company slides that were reviewed by the legal department and the marketing department. To do this, the World College of Refractive Surgery and Visual Sciences, which is forming as we speak, and a lot of you are going to hear about this in the next few months. We believe that this forms the basis for creating a global institution that mirrors the aviation industry, ICAO, which takes care of safety, efficiency, security, and all of the aspects of the industry globally, so that there is an arm's length rule book, and everyone is now confident in this market, so that 
the market can grow and the safety can increase for the overall presbyopic surgical recipient. Thank you very much.